that does something to you when you overcome something that you're afraid of and then there, you realize there's something on the other side and then you start to see what else am i afraid of and fear is really the whole game like if you master fear you're ma you'll master life fear stops us from doing so many things it's all in our head and most of it is a relic from from our childhood Welcome back to the You Can Too podcast. On today's show, we have David Sutcliffe on the show. He is a retired actor for 20 plus years, most commonly known for his role in Gilmore Girls. And now he is a somatic practitioner and doing some truly amazing things in this space. And I want to jump into your earlier years in life. What I feel for a lot of people that get into this space in any capacity, there was something, a few different pivotal moments that happened throughout their childhood that led them down this path, whether it was consciously or unconsciously. I'm curious for you, what are some of those things that kind of led you to want to learn more about this space? About acting, you mean? Or I, just no, about I mean, I mean, diving into somatic, everything oh, that somatic you're putting work, into now. Yeah. yeah, the stuff that you, you're loving. Um, well, you know, it's funny. I watched a, a Woody Allen movie uh Manhattan I think it was on TV I must have been 11 or 12 years old and there was a scene with a psychiatrist mm. and they were talking about the unconscious and I, I and I I got a you know I was 11 12 years old yeah. I didn't quite know what it meant but there was something about the way that they were talking about it and this idea that we had an unconscious and that there were uh, emotions and feelings and thoughts that we didn't know about, we didn't understand that were uh, having a big impact on our lives. And I, I don't know why, I was just absolutely fascinated by that. And then uh, my friend's mother asked me uh, shortly after that, well, you know, the typical question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. And I said, a psychiatrist. And she said, you want to listen to people's problems? And I said, yeah. And I, you know, and then I went on to become an actor and, but now that's exactly what I'm doing. So I don't, you know, why are we interested in the things we're interested in? I, I, I don't know, but I, I was always fascinated by um, psychology, by people's minds, by emotions, by why and uh, how people did what they did. Uh, I was very, very curious about human beings and, uh, and their psyches uh, from, the, from the very beginning, really. It seems like those those are the curious people, right? Like I started this podcast because I want to ask questions like that. Like that is the, at the core, it, I, I'm curious about other people and curious about things that, I mean, I didn't know there was an unconscious or subconscious until I was 17, probably 18. And I mean, we're going through life mostly just not being aware of it to begin with. So was it, it wasn't conscious when you were 12, of course, but when did you actually start practicing? I know in your twenties, you started to get into talk therapy and obviously you're doing some deeper things now, but when did that become prominent for you? Well, it was it, when I was 25, 26, I was in a relationship and we started to have relationship problems. And mm. I was reading a little bit about psychology and spirituality. And I started to understand that there was, there was patterns being played out, mm. unconscious patterns. Like we were having the same fight over and over again. And so I started going to therapy then just to, I don't know, try to understand what was going on. Uh, and so I started, yeah, 26 and, uh, you know, I, I had a couple of different therapists early on. Like I was trying a few people out just to get a sense of things and to find somebody that I, that I groove with, but I got the basic concept of it is that there were things that happened to me in my childhood that had left an imprint on me. And, uh, I had drawn like maybe false conclusions or developed belief systems uh, a perspective of the world and, and, and a perspective of myself in response to some of the things that had happened to me, some of the, the traumatic things, you know, painful things, scary things that happened to all of us in childhood. I didn't have a particularly traumatic childhood. I mean, my parents split when I was six years old and my mother was very young. And, and, and looking back at it now, I, I can see that there was a lot of chaos and instability and that certainly would have had uh, an impact on me and did have an impact on me. And, uh, it was just getting to the root of all of that, trying to understand how that impacted me, why that impacted me, how it was playing out in my life because, uh, I was suffering in some way and I, I, I couldn't figure out why, and there was no, 
practical solution that I could come up with. So I knew that it was something deeper, probably something scary to confront. But once I started going to therapy and, and, and found a, a good therapist that I liked, um, then I just, I was, got so into it. I was just so fascinated by, by therapy and the process of it. It is really fascinating to to know that there's a story that we tell ourselves about who we are and how the world is, and that literally controls how we see events in our life and how they play out in our lives. And it's, it is something that fascinates me to such an extreme extent. I don't think I'll ever be on just, I, I'm always going to want to dive into this space deeper and deeper and deeper. I know that you didn't plan on getting into um, acting when you were younger. You were a jock in high school and then some, some things happened with basketball and it led you down this path. But what was the story that you were telling yourself <laughs> growing up? Maybe it was conscious, maybe it wasn't, but that led you down that path to begin with. Um, I think I, the story that I told myself was that my me and my family were not okay there was something wrong with us we were outsiders we weren't like everybody else um i went to catholic school and I, there was only two of us that were from divorced families mm. and my mom stopped going to church once she got divorced because she felt a lot of shame about the divorce and and she felt uh ostracized by her family which, you know, was part, partly her own doing, but nevertheless, that was the experience that I had that I was always in some way an outsider didn't fit in and separate is painful. And in some ways I was made special because I was a good athlete and I was, I was a very cute kid. So I got a lot of attention from the teachers and from girls, yeah. but, and that was nice for my ego, but it also made me a little bit different than everybody else and and just exacerbated this feeling that um that I was separate that I was alone and so I think that that was the predominant image that I had and I think one of the reasons that I became an actor was really so that um I would be seen and fit in so if I had this status if I was famous like my value my worth was undeniable and I think that's what I was longing for. But once I got there, of course, nothing changed. I mean, I, I, I had lots of success, but the internal feelings of isolation and loneliness and, and, and a general feeling of not uh, knowing how to connect, probably a lot of shame unconsciously and anger, of course. I think I had a lot of anger about uh, my father leaving and the ways that... Um, I had to, uh, become the man of the family at a very young age and sort of had to give up my childhood and my innocence. And I, I had a lot of anger and resentment about that unconsciously. So, uh, all of that was stewing <laughs> and, um, playing out in, in all the areas of my life. And I just, I just realized the decisions I was making, um, I thought were rational. I thought were based on, oh, this is, you know, I'm following some instinct. Yeah. But in fact, I was uh, acting out some unconscious pattern, trying to resolve issues from my childhood that remained unresolved. Yeah, which, again, I feel like this whole conversation is going to be a bunch of stuff that just fascinates me because it's yeah. a, a lot of similarities with we're we're being driven by things that we're not even aware that we're being driven of. And I want to dive into that because you're at the top of the top of everything external you could possibly want. And internally, you feel like, I mean, it doesn't reflect that. And I feel for a lot of people, you almost have to get to that point to realize it. It's like the Jim Carrey quote of like, I wish everyone could get uh, successful and all the money in the world to realize that it's not what they want kind of thing. W what is the, um, the navigator? How do you uh, see what is driving you and what isn't driving you? Like, when did that start to be prominent in recognizing that that was more of an unconscious trying to be seen the ego kind of controlling things. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a, an example. I was, uh, started doing serious group therapy in mm -hmm. my mid thirties. So at this point I'd already done a lot of talk therapy and, uh, uh you know, for maybe almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, but this was a whole different thing. This was the somatic therapy, core energetics, and it was and Bradley. very, very deep dive into our feelings. And yeah. my second retreat, uh, 
I, I got into all this stuff with my father, sort of my anger and disappointment, disappointment with my father for him not being there. And eventually, uh, you know, I was in a kind of regressed state. Mm -hmm. So almost like I was reliving the experience of the, of the six year old, of the seven year old. Yeah. And I started to like just sob uncontrollably. And there were probably tears that that little boy wanted to cry, but couldn't or, or wouldn't. Yeah. Um, and they came through and then the words came out, which were, uh, he never saw me play. I play hard for him. And what I was referring to was hockey. I was a competitive hockey player, as was my father. And I sort of knew him as a hockey player. That was the mythology in, in the little boy's mind that I'd created around my dad. My dad was a hockey player. And in that moment, I realized that like, I was playing hockey and I was playing hard, playing, which I was notorious for being ultra competitive, yeah. that I was doing that to win his love and that he had never seen me play. Which, you know, for a boy to never have your father see you play the game that he loved and now the game that you love, it, it was painful, so painful that I disassociated from it. I didn't even have, I, I, the, the memory only came up when I allowed myself to, to cry like that and, and lose control and, and, and release. And then suddenly that repressed memory came up and, and it was true. It, it, you know, it was, it was actually, true. He had never seen me play. So at that point I thought, well, what else am I doing in my life to try to win the love of my father or win the love of my mother? And if that's the case, then I'm not really free. I'm, I'm, I'm living in response to circumstance. I'm, I'm, I'm really a slave to this idea that I'm unloved, and if I can do these things, like become a famous actor, or win this hockey game, then I'll get the love that I was longing for, which obviously we all know is not true. Yeah. And, but we can understand that cognitively. But these layers were very, very deep. And I was only able to get to them by doing this, this you know, quite intense retreat with all of these techniques that, I mean, there's a lot of great therapies out there, but that allow you to get into these feelings and, and uncover and unravel them. So that was a big moment. And then I started to question everything in my life, mm -hmm. started to question my entire career. I mean, that was really the beginning of the end of my acting career. Yeah. Because then I started to examine, why am I doing this? What's the real reason? And, and then I started to look at my relationships and, and the women that I was generally attracted to. And I'm like, what, what is going on there? Am I, am I attracted to women that are, have some quality that my, that my mother has? And I'm, I'm unconsciously trying to work out my issues with my mother with this person, which you know doesn't feel very uh, romantic or conscious. So all of that you know, just upended my whole world. And really, for the next 10 years, uh, I just went deep, deep, deep into my psyche um, on a path to uh, try to uncover all of it. Yeah. And again, it's it's profound to dive into this kind of stuff, because I think that we try to solve a lot of our problems through the mind. And that's just not how things work. And I've recognized that the more that I get into this space, because um, I grew up without a father as well. My father passed when I was six years old. My mom and dad got divorced when I was two. So uh, any kind of father figure, there was no father figure in my life whatsoever. And so listening to your work and listening to some of the, the podcasts that you were, you taking the kind of father figure of, of the interviews that you've done and everything that you put in, um, it really made me think about like my childhood and the way that I've been playing out and some of the things that I need to address and, and think deeper in. I know that you say that all problems in society are a lack of a father. Why do you feel that that is such a prominent part of society? And why do you feel that that is truth for you or even for everyone? Yeah, well, right now I think it's it's a big problem. I mean, the, the society feels like it's gone into chaos, and I think you know men's role in the culture has been diminished. We know that uh, boys and girls are growing up more and more without fathers present, mm -hmm. and certainly the criticism of men is justified. Men have uh, been corrupt with their power and and abusive, and and done a lot of bad things in the world. 
but without uh, men around providing uh, stability and security for children, um, it creates a lot of fear. Yeah. Uh, because a child can sense that the mother cannot really protect them from danger. Um, and so that creates an unease in, in the family and in the dynamic. There's just a general feeling that the children don't, they don't feel safe. And the truth is the, the mother also feels it. Like she knows she's not quite safe. Women are not safe in the world. I mean, that's yeah. not something that we like to think about, but there's, there's, there's bad people out there and there's, there's yeah. bad men and, and um, women need protecting. Uh, and they need, need protecting uh, from men, by men. And if men are not there, there's going to be uh, a lot of compensation, a lot of rationalization, but emotionally, uh, there's going to be a lot of fear. And fear ends up uh, causing, I think, is the source of a lot of addiction, mm -hmm. a lot of um, just mental illness in general, like borderline personality and, and just general acting out, um, promiscuity in women, uh, misplaced aggression in men. I mean, we know all the statistics yeah. um, about fatherless homes and the impact that they have on children. And it's not true the other way. So if you're raised with just a father without a mother, I mean, there's obviously a big void there, yeah. but children are not getting into the same kind of trouble yeah. that they are without the father around. So, uh, listen, uh, it's a sensitive subject, obviously, because there are so many people, women, um, who have been hurt uh, by men and are angry with men. But, uh, you know, demonizing the father, I think is, is, and we're seeing it now is very, very detrimental to the culture. So we've got to find a way to bring fathers back and, and really value the contribution they make. And men have to be willing fathers to assert their authority. And what I mean by that is their authority as a parent. Like there are things that the father knows that the mother doesn't know. There are ways that, uh, to parent that a, a father is more, um, uh, just developed in that the mother is not going to be, and you need that balance to create harmony within the family. And so I think what you see is a lot of men stand back in the parenting role because it's incredibly difficult yeah. and they let the mother, you know, uh, bear the burden of it. And then of course uh, the mother feels uh, resentment around that and that creates all kinds of problems. So you know, at the end of the day, ultimately what is it that well men have to take responsibility for themselves for their role in the culture and for their role in the family and i think we're seeing more and more of that now mm -hmm. um there's men's work organizations yeah. springing up everywhere people like jordan peterson and andrew tate who are mm -hmm. espousing this message of you know be strong be capable clean up your room uh provide and protect for your woman. That's your job. So I think it's out there and, and men are responding to it. And uh, I think things are going to change, but we just, you know, this is a period we went through and we're continuing to continuing to go through it. But yeah, fathers are uh, very, very important. Yeah. I was speaking with a friend right before this um, and he, he listened to your interview with Andrew Tate and he said it was probably his favorite interview that he ever listened to. And uh, I said that the, your presence was very felt and the, the way that you really maneuvered the conversation. I, I know you went in with like no preparation and that's the best kind of way to go about things and going down the rabbit holes of different things. What was it about that interview or what's something that you took from that interview that maybe changed the, your worldview or the way that you kind of approached life? Well, I mean, Andrew is a very smart guy and he, his, his philosophy is thought through. And, uh, so he was very convincing and there was a lot of things that I learned from him uh, because I challenged him and he had answers for a lot of things that I said that were good answers, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I was like, that's that, may, you know, you've made yeah. a point now yeah. we're coming from, uh, different perspectives, obviously. And, uh, you know, and he was kind enough to acknowledge that there were, there were some things that, that he learned from me as well. Um, I guess. 
I, I, I'm what I what I like about what Andrew talked about and continues to talk about is that life is pain and there's no getting around it. And if you spend your life avoiding pain, avoiding suffering, you're just not going to be effective in this world. Right? Yeah. It's, it's just what it is. And you cannot be a slave to your feelings. You can't wake up every day and say, you know, I, I don't feel like doing this. You just don't have that option. You have a yeah. responsibility as a man. You have a responsibility to your ancestors. Your ancestors uh, survived. And the reason that you're here is because of them and all the suffering that they went through and that you owe them a debt. And part of that debt is to be make yourself as, as strong as you possibly can and, and give the most of yourself and, and be committed every day. And I think those are great values. And, and I really admire and respect uh, how he holds those values and, 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 and lives by them. I mean, he's, he's, he's the real deal. You know, he works his ass off and uh, he practices what he preaches. So I think that's part of the reason that he's so not just successful, but, but, but popular. No, I'm, I'm, I'm in full support of that for sure. I think it's, it's, um, it's something that we want to avoid the responsibility. It's something that we want to almost push on to other people. I always say that if it might not be my fault, but it's still my responsibility at the end of the day, that's the, my kind of the way that I look at things. And your, your biggest uh, code that you live by is to not betray yourself. I find that that is something so, so powerful because I think that at the core, when we go down a path that we don't want to go down or we create a life that we're not really in, in invigorated by is, is simply because we don't keep the promises we make to ourselves. We're, mm -hmm. we're betraying ourselves by not keeping mm -hmm. those promises as subtle as they sound. What, when did that become almost your motto or the way that you live your life? When did that become so prominent for you? When I realized how often I was betraying myself and the, the problems that it was causing me in, in my life. I mean, we, we learn to betray ourselves as children because we have no choice. Uh, we, our priority as a child is to stay in connection and in favor with our caregivers. So the aspects of ourselves that our caregivers do not like or, or, or reject in some way or ignore, uh, we're going to push into the shadows. And then the aspects of ourselves that um, are received and, and, and get praise, we're going to accentuate those. So right away, we're betraying ourselves. We're, we're shaping ourselves into something um, to make our parents happy. And then we take that blueprint, that, that map of reality, and we, we take that out into the world and, and we bring that to, to all of our relationships. And um, what happens, of course, is uh, we end up feeling a lot of resentment because we end up doing things that we don't want to do because we're no longer a child who needs to win the love of their parents. We're an adult in an adult relationship. We're still playing out that unconscious pattern. And it plays out a lot with with boundaries really and 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 people doing things that they don't want to do or 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 doing not doing things that they actually want to do and saying yes when they want to say no saying no when they want to say yes and i think it happens so fast that people are not even aware that they're doing it and what then they end up blaming the other person for you know whatever not being sensitive to their feelings or not, not respecting their boundaries when they haven't really enforced their boundaries at all. So it's a very um, uh, difficult thing when you, when you come to terms with that's what you're doing and, and then you have to start playing a new game because it's scary yeah. because there's that part of you that's still the little kids like, I'm going to get in trouble. Or maybe you have an image that it's like selfish, you know, if I just do what I want. But the truth is, and I've said this many times, I want everybody to do what they want. And I don't want anybody who's in relationship with me to do anything that they don't want to do for me. That, that, that doesn't feel like a healthy relationship. I mean, people can make uh, judgments. They can, they can uh, make uh, determinations uh, about what is good or right for them. Like, so, you know, cause we're, we're in relationship. We, it's, it's not like we're always going to be totally selfish, but, but that place where you're really doing something you don't want to do, I just think it leads to resentment. And, and on the other side of that is, I think is freedom. And, and the, it really becomes very simple. Is it, it's a yes or a no. And so that's what I do now. And if I'm not sure, I say, I'll, I'll, I'll wait a day and I'll, 
I'll get back to you. But if somebody asks me something, I just, I sit with it and I'm like, what's the feeling? Do I want to do this? I don't worry about the story. I don't worry about the implications. I don't worry about if I'm going to hurt their feelings. I don't worry about any of that. I just say yes or no. And, and then you see what happens. Yeah. There, there's always compromise, but you still have to be in alignment with yourself. And yeah. that, that intuition, that, that, that feeling of, of being able to know what you truly feel in alignment with, you know, you've stepped a lot into this space of, you know, you've done Sweat Lodge, Vision Quest, Ayahuasca, you've done a bunch of different things that really got you into, you know, almost inflicting suffering on yourself. It's like, it's like uh, Andrew Tate said, like, life is pain. Like, usually the people that are the most enlightened people in the world inflict suffering within themselves so that they can get used to that experience. What is some of the the main takeaways that you've taken away from all of the extensive work that you've done into really diving into that and being able to get more in touch with that. You can take it. You're stronger than you think. It's not mm -hmm. that bad. It's just in your head. It's all in your head. I mean, sweat lodge is a perfect example. You, you, you get in there and it can get very, very hot in sweat lodge, uncomfortably yeah. hot. And if you're packed in there tight, you know, and I have claustrophobia. So sweat lodges were scary for me from yeah. the beginning. And yeah, you can be packed in there, not always, but sometimes in a way that, you know, there's somebody right here, there's somebody right here, there's somebody sitting right in front of you, there's nowhere to go. You can barely move and you, you might be in there for 90 minutes and, and you know, it's in four rounds and, and so it's, it, it gets very hot for a short period of time, but, you know, it's, it's, it's long enough that it can be extremely uncomfortable and you, you can get scared and have a fear response and just feel this party that wants to get out of there. But what happens over time is you realize like you can take it, like you can take the heat. And if you just kind of like focus and sort of breathe into your heart, like it, you're going to get through it. And the more you do that, the stronger you get. And, and that does something to you when you overcome something that you're afraid of. And then there, you realize there's something on the other side. And then you start to see, well, what else am I afraid of? That's not that I can overcome. Mm -hmm. And the fear was really just, it was, it was, it's not that you're not going to experience discomfort, but you're not going to die. Yeah. It's going to be fine. It's just in your head and you can get through it. And so I think it's really important to do things that scare you. Uh, one of the things I do often with my clients is, you know, I have them make, have them make a list of risks. Mm. Like what's a risk that you can take every day or, you know, the very least every week. And they, it might just be a small little risk, but, but risks are, what are risks? They're, well, it's confronting something that you're afraid of. And I think it's a muscle you, that you can build. And I think the more you do it, the stronger you get, because fear is just, I mean, fear is really the whole game. Yeah. Like if you master fear, you're ma you'll master life. Fear stops us from doing so many things. And the, it's, it's all in our head. And most of it is, um, a relic from, from our childhood. I mean, now there's yeah. natural fear. Obviously I see a lion and I get scared or two guys are chasing me, whatever. That, that, that's not what I'm talking about. Right. I'm talking about a fear that I'm going to be, um, you know, humiliated. I'm going to be exposed. I'm going to be rejected. I'm not going to be loved. Uh, people are going to make fun of me. All of, of those kinds of fears, which can be very real if, if you felt excluded or, or bullied in some way as a child. But these physical practices like sweat lodge and, and there's many other things, they train you. They, 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 they help you realize that it's like it's, it's just in your head. And if you can sort of orient yourself, you know, breathe into your body, whatever it is, like you can get through it and you're going to be OK. Yeah, fear is really the thing that drives everyone's life for the most part. I, I, feel, I feel for a lot of people, they have a, a constant ambient anxiety throughout their life. Um, I think high performers definitely associate themselves with that, where they always need to be in movement. They always need to be moving forward in some capacity. And I feel, um, and especially in creative work, whether you're an actor, you're, you're, uh, in somatic practitioner, like whatever it comes down to, you're always trying to progress in some way. And I feel like there's a, a detachment. We need to be able to detach ourselves from the outcome or from the next thing that we're trying to get to, um, Outside of the, you know, the sweat lodge and everything else that you've done, what are some of the practices that you incline people to be able to step into so that they can gain more control over that fear rather than having it be the thing that drives their life? Yeah. Well, I think the obvious one is, is meditation. Oh, yeah. And the reason that you want to practice meditation is because you want to develop the observer self. Mm -hmm. 
So we're usually identified with our ego, you know, our thoughts, our beliefs, and they're running around in our mind. And it, it feels like it's who we are, but it's not who we are. But there is a part of us that can observe our own mind and can observe our own feelings. And that observation creates a little space between you and the feelings and you and the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that gap is where you can really start to uh, change your life. Because you're fried, if you're identified with everything you think and everything you feel and you feel like that is me, well, you, you are going to be a slave to your thoughts and feelings because you, you don't have control over them. They're, they're just coming up. You don't know where your thoughts come. You don't understand where your feelings come from. They're just coming up. So you have to develop this part of you that can observe yourself. Just like you're observing a character on the movie screen, you are identified with them. You can feel what they're feeling, but you're, you're separate from them. You can, you can see them. And from that place, you can have a lot more perspective. Uh, so meditation is, that's what that is a practice for. I mean, there's a lot of other benefits of meditation, but developing the observer self, I think is the most important. Um, and it's really what I do in my work. I'm, I'm teaching people to get in touch with feelings that maybe scare them or feelings that they judge and just be able to observe them right now the obvious ones yeah the places where we're afraid or or we have uh pain that we don't want to feel but the scarier ones in some sense are our dark feelings like our hatred or our rage or our desire to punish i mean you're seeing it right now <laughs> in the world i mean everybody is activated and you see that everybody's got this killer inside them pointing the finger at the the other side as saying that they need to die that's pretty intense so it's taking ownership of that 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 shadow part of us the lower self because if we don't know it if we don't uh take ownership of it it's going we're going to act out on it in more subtle covert ways and cause a lot of destruction in our lives so that's that's a big thing that i teach is is getting in touch with our shadow emotions the feelings and and to not judge them uh, you know we don't like the idea uh, that that we have hate mm -hmm. uh but we all feel hatred at different times it doesn't mean we're a hateful person it's just a feeling and it's covering up something else it's 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 not about the hatred hate is a defense against fear and pain and so if you can start to understand that you're like that that part of your uh you, those aggressive emotions that can scare us are really a defense against pain that can that can give you a little uh compassion for yourself there but that's that's a that practice that's the thing i'm trying to teach first and foremost stop identifying with your feelings and with your thoughts which is not an easy thing to do but um you can do it with it's like anything else it's just practice you know you want to get strong you got to go to the gym you want to develop that observer self muscle you're going to have to meditate yeah it it has been the the other than going on walks which i know that you you you're a big avid walker for sure um has been the, the biggest habit that i've incorporated in my life that's changed the direction of my life because the fact that i'm not who i think i am was such a big realization for me to begin with i think for a lot of us we're going around as you said the idea of ourself and i think i want to dive into your journey too because leaving acting i mean the admiration the money the fame all of the things that we would our ego loves like that that's what we're searching for and then you left that you knew it wasn't you knew it was the right decision for you and for a lot of people it almost felt like how can you make that decision but i know it didn't really feel like a decision what, how was that identity shift for you stepping into what you're doing today? It was really hard to make that transition. I, I was identified with being an actor. I had, you know, I had success and uh, I was in the community and I had a, you know, agent and a manager and friends and I was going to parties and I was making a lot of money and kissing pretty actresses, the whole, the whole thing, the dream. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. It was shocking to me. I, I, so um, I'd made it. And when I discovered that it wasn't making me happy or was no longer making me happy, and, and suddenly I was drawn to this very weird, <laughs> on the outside, it, look, it can look very yeah. weird therapy. 
um, I'd wondered if I'd lost my mind. And certainly people around me wondered the same. But I felt called in a, in a deep way. And it, and it wasn't all in a flash. I mean, I, 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 I came out of my first radical liveness workshop and that that that's the name of the workshop that my teacher Ann Bradney that's what she calls her work but it's based on core energetics which is a, a somatic psychotherapy that was started by John Parakis back in the 70s evolved out of bioenergetics and there's a whole lineage to it um but I knew that I wanted to pursue it in some way and then I, when I joined the training program, I wasn't thinking that I was going to give up acting uh, and start and become a therapist. It was just like, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm passionate about it. I'm interested in it. There was still, I thought my career was in Hollywood and I was going to live the rest of my life in Los Angeles. But uh, the deeper I got into it, um, the less interested I became in acting. And I started to feel resentment on set. Like I just wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. And I was just that, you know, nobody wants to be that guy who's not happy no. at work and sort of taking it out on people. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, I, you know, I, I got to get out of this, but that's how I made my money and I made good money and it was easy money in some way. So, and I was, again, I was, yeah, I was identified with it. You know, you have a lot of, uh, status in the society. Yeah. When uh, when you're a famous actor, just you know walking through the airports, you get good seats at restaurants and and all of that. So to give that up felt very very difficult. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I, the reason I became an actor is because I was following something, and I just continued to follow what was interesting to me. I, it, as, as you said, it didn't really feel like a choice for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did resist it because I didn't know what my life was going to look like. Yeah. And I was scared, you know, and I was also, it wasn't, you know, it's one thing to change careers at, I don't know, 35. It's another mm. thing to change careers at 50. <laughs> you know, so it was a little, a little scary at, at my, at that age to think, well, I got to have to build something entirely new, but you know, what was I going to do? This is, this is what was happening. I was just following what I was interested in, where my passion was. Yeah. And I mean, it's, I always say that you do a disservice by not bringing your unique gifts into the world. And so the fact that you stepped into this, there's obviously good reason for it and you're helping a lot of people. So I want to thank you for doing that to begin with, because we wouldn't be on this, on this call right now. I, I know that you started in talk therapy and then you, you jumped into working with Anne and everyone and everyone else. And now it's just like a part of who you are. What are some of the differentiators that maybe you seen from talk therapy and then diving into the work that you do? Um, why do you feel that your work is so prominent? Cause I, I definitely can resonate with the, uh, trying to solve problems with my mind and not really being within my feelings. And I think that that's something be it consciously or unconsciously. I think a lot of people struggle with, and that's obviously why you're doing what you're doing. How has that been such a, a shift, I guess, for you, especially living your life kind of through the opposite lens, I guess. Yeah. Well, um, you know, as I said, I started going to therapy when I was 26 and I got a lot of value from it. I, I started to understand as we talked about earlier, like, oh, this is what happened when I was a child. And, yeah. and this is the connection between what happened there and, and why I'm behaving this way as an adult. But the problems persisted. I mean, I had more awareness and consciousness around them, but the problems continue to persist. So I knew I was looking for something else. And yeah, there was just this, I knew I wasn't feeling mm. like I couldn't cry. And, it, it, but it wasn't just that there was something I could feel like I was stuck. I was blocked something. I wasn't free inside myself. And I just had this instinct, like I, I need to feel. And so when I finally found this therapy, which, you know, has different tools, like, you know, you, you have this mallet, and you hit a foam block mm -hmm. and you, know, you kick and you punch and breath work and you let out sound and you go in these different stress positions. The idea being that we hold our, our stuck emotions in our bodies. Absolutely. And if we can like start to move our bodies in different ways that that feeling is going to come. And of course, everybody knows that when you start hitting a punching bag, all of a sudden you feel all this aggression come out of you and, you know, you're hitting your ex-boyfriend or your ex-girlfriend, like, or whatever it is, like feelings start to come. So it's really the same thing. It's just that we're doing it with a lot more technique and 
and consciousness to really take people to, to their deep feelings. So when I discovered this therapy, it was a liberation. And it was like, this was what I was looking for. And I thought, this is the evolution of psychotherapy. Because as you said, um, you can't solve a problem of the mind with the mind, because you're just going to loop forever and ever and ever. And yeah. what the mind does is it creates constructs, it creates paradigms, uh, belief systems in response to the suppressed feelings. So your mind is actually uh, working against you. It, the mind is not wanting you to feel these feelings, and it creates an entire vision of reality to help you avoid these feelings because it believes that it's not safe to feel yeah. them, right? So it, it's, a, it's, it's rational from the ego's perspective, it, but it's not true. And so in order to heal, we have to be willing to let go of control. And the mind will not let go of control unless you take a bunch of mushrooms or drink some ayahuasca, or you come to one of my workshops and, you know, start hitting this block in a way where you start to lose control and then the feelings come up. Like what happened to me at that workshop where I made this realization around my father. That would not have happened. I would not have had that realization sitting in a chair in therapy. I needed to lose control. My body needed to be shaking from all of these tears and this this grief and pain needed to be needed to come through in order for me to have that realization. So I, I just I'm a, a big believer in in somatic therapy. And, um, in the, in, particularly in the, uh, cathartic work that I do, it's not for everybody. Certainly like you need to have a certain kind of ego structure, enough grounding. Yeah. I would say that uh, it's definitely not right for everybody, but if you are drawn to it, um, it, it's, you know, it, it's unlike anything that you've ever, ever experienced. I mean, I've had a number of people come to my workshops, people who've done, uh, you know, 50 ayahuasca ceremonies, which most people think are the most terrifying thing. And they're like, yeah. this is way scarier than ayahuasca. And that's how I feel because I've done a lot yeah. of ayahuasca ceremonies and th there's something about this work because there's, you are present. That's the whole idea. Are you willing to be all the way present with all of who you are and with everything you feel? Can you stay here in this moment? and stay with yourself and be witnessed by others in the depth of your pain, in your fear, in your rage, whatever, whatever it is, can you be here? And if you can do that, it's, it's, it, you are then, uh, have access to all of your aliveness, all of your life force. Uh, you're not holding back anything. You're not avoiding anything. You're not afraid of anything. And can take that out into life and feel like, well, I, I, what, what can't I do if I'm not afraid to feel, what am I actually afraid of? Yeah. That's the most profound thing. I think it's, um, and I want to, I want to touch on that with, with you. Cause I'd love to learn more about your, everything that you do. I think it's so, so powerful. I, I know a lot of people in the space and heard so many just amazing amazing things about it. I think it's really important for people to even recognize that we have those unconscious, unmet needs that are driving us. Because to begin with, if we're not aware that that's even a thing, well, then we can't address them at all. Um, and, and that's where I think the, the hurdle is, is for many people. I, I want to ask for you, you have a lot of wisdom, in, not just in this space, but just in general, you've, you've done a lot of different things and, and been down a lot of different roads. What's something that you spent a lot of time on that I should skip entirely? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a, that's a really good question. Well, I, I think the, I think you got to give up the idea that there's something to fix. Mm -hmm. That's usually the way into self-help. There's something wrong with me and I got to fix it. Like it's a setup because you're never going to, if you believe there's something wrong with you, if that's a belief that you have then when you fix that thing, your mind is going to create a new thing that's wrong with you that you're going to have to fix. And you're going to play that loop over and over and over and over again. This is why people, you know, uh, their diets fail or they can't stick to a workout plan or they procrastinate or they say they're going to, you know, write every morning for 
you know, the rest of their lives, but they give up after three weeks. It's rooted in the belief system. And so we will ultimately self-sabotage from that place. The truth is you have to accept yourself exactly as you are right now in this moment. I mean, all your problems can be solved if you're willing to love yourself exactly as you are. That's, that's it. Now, that's not an easy thing to do because you say, well, wait, no, there's all these things wrong with me. I do this, I do that. And, and, and fair enough, but those are the symptoms of the underlying problem, which is that you don't love yourself. And if you can love and accept yourself, right? It's like all those problems will go away, but we feel like we have to do something. We have to take action in order to, um, well, like I said, to fix. Yeah. And it's not, it's not that we shouldn't take action. It's not that we shouldn't be disciplined, but you have to ask yourself, why, why am I doing this? Am I working out? Uh, because I want to feel good because I want to be strong. Or am I working out because, you know, when I get muscles uh, or when I lose all this weight, then I will finally be loved. If that's the case, right, it, you're, you're just going to continue to spiral. You, maybe you get fit and, you know, there's, everybody's got this story. And that was my story. I'm going to become a famous actor and then I'm going to be loved. Then all my problems are going to go away. And that didn't happen at all. It actually just made my problems worse because I had everything that I wanted, I still wasn't happy, and it was almost more frustrating. Does that yeah, make sense? You think, absolutely, you think that that's gonna be the solution, and then when you get and recognize it's not the solution, then all the problems are even more exacerbated, and then you have to deal with them even more. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a continuous cycle. I think people treat themselves almost like they're a self-improvement project, like when I fix right. this problem, but it's like problems replace problems, they're never gonna go away, like you said, and I think, um, I've been seeing my mind is almost like chat GPT, where in a sense of if I, if I ask myself a bad question, I'm going to, it's going to prompt a bad answer. I'm going to take a different action. And if I ask a different question, it's going to be the same exact thing. And I think if we, if we approach life through that lens, we're able to, I think even like, like people that procrastinate, like they see the procrastination as a problem. And I, I come in and I say, well, the, the reality here is that procrastination isn't the problem. It's a symptom to the problem, AKA fear. And so yeah. at the core, it's like fear is, is really everything. With your work and everything that you're putting into the world, what do you feel is the the driving factor for for most people? Is it safety or is it trying to stay away from fear? I guess that's kind of the same. Like, where do you feel most people are being driven by, or what they're being driven by? Yeah, I mean, we have an unconscious des desire to stay safe. You know, as I said earlier, like things get imprinted on us as children, and so we may learn that it's not safe to express our anger. We may learn that it's not safe to ask for what we need. We may learn that it's not safe to, um, you know, show some aspect of ourself or to, to, to bring out our voice. And why is it not safe? Because we were either ignored there or maybe we were humiliated or made fun of. And th to a child, that's extraordinarily painful, especially when it happens repeatedly. And the truth is, uh, and this is an uncomfortable truth. But parents can be very cruel to their children. And it's not always intentional. Sometimes it is. But children are difficult. And they're out of control. And they're innocent. And they're unfiltered. And that can bring up a lot of issues in parents. And which we know. I mean, children take parents totally out of control. And in those moments, the parent can just want to like shut down the part of the child that is making them feel the thing that they don't want to feel, which is connected to their childhood and connected to their, their parents' childhood. And it goes on and on. So we've, we've all experienced that in some way or other. So we learn that it's, it's not safe to bring out certain aspects of ourselves, And, um, and so then when we go out in the world, that's the feeling we have. We may not be conscious of it. So it's like, oh, I want to uh, say this thing. I want to post on social media and, and I want to talk about this thing. Like my, my girlfriend just had something. We talked about it last night. There's an eclipse on Saturday. And she wants, she created this whole thing about the eclipse, like a video in this presentation. 
And she was like, I'm really scared to share it. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? This is like what you do. You're into this shit. Everybody knows yeah. this. And she's like, but there's some place where I feel like I'm going to get into trouble. And she couldn't quite pinpoint what it was about. Like it was something from her childhood, maybe a past life. I don't know. But there was something that she felt like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Hmm. And it makes no sense, of course, but the feeling was very strong. And she had to you know, overcome it. And, and obviously she did post it. But those, you know, she had also a lot of awareness around that. A lot of times we won't even have that awareness. We just have this feeling that it's not safe. And we buy into that. And then we project out into the world all kinds of you know, nonsense or, or, or danger when the, the truth is nobody cares. Nobody really cares if you, what, I mean, maybe in the short term, you know, somebody yeah. will be upset by the thing you have to say or, but at the end of the day, nobody really cares. Everybody's kind of lost in their own world, but that fear, um, is embedded in our psyche. So yes, most of our like, uh, issues like procrastination, they're actually attempts to keep us safe. I'm going to procrastinate on this project I'm working on because if I actually work on this project, put it out into the world, I might be rejected. I might get hurt. I might fail. And I don't want to feel that mm -hmm. because it's painful to me. So the way I'm going to sabotage that is through procrastination. It's just, as you said, it's just fear acting out and with the intention of keeping us protected. Yeah. It, it sounds so logical when you say it, and it makes sense. It all makes sense. But when it actually happens in life, and that's why I wanted to dive deeper into that and, and kind of get more of an idea, because I think when we're not, again, the, 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 the realization that we're not aware of most of what's going on in our life or the feelings that are directing our life is, is, is really sad. It's really sad. I don't know what other word sad. to use. Um, and that's why I, I, I want to dive into this space and continue trying to speak with people like you and you're putting amazing things in the world because I think it's so important to gain the awareness of this and actually address those things rather than getting to the end of your life and being unsettled with what you could have created simply because there was unconscious things driving the, the really your life. And mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important. There's one last question I ask every guest encapsulates what I want to do with this podcast. The question is, what belief are you currently unlearning? That's a, that's a good question. What belief am I currently unlearning? Um, it, it probably for me has to do with love and relationship. Mm -hmm. So my mother was married, married three times. And so for me, relationships equal pain and women, cause my mother left my father and left my stepfather and, and for good reasons. I'm not, I'm not judging my mother. My mother's amazing and, and a loving woman. Nevertheless, that had a, a profound experience on me, which was, I don't trust women. Yeah. And so what do you do when you don't trust women? You date women who are not trustworthy to confirm the belief that you don't trust women because otherwise you'd have to open your heart to a woman and that would be too terrifying because your heart might get broken. So you just avoid the whole thing altogether. And that's what I did for years. Uh, I dated women essentially that were on some level uh, not right for me or unavailable. And that was a way that I was able to keep distance and, and protect myself. It was my ego, unconscious part of me, thinking that it was keeping me safe. So what I'm now learning is that women can be trusted and that there's safety in love and there is joy and comfort in relationship. And that's uh, something, unfortunately, <laughs> or, well, or fortunately, uh, the, I mean, it's fortunate that I finally came to it. I guess unfortunate that it took me so long, but that's just what it was. Uh, I resisted relationship for a long time. I was alone for a long time and, and now I'm engaged to be married to a wonderful woman. And, and she was very strong and patient as I, I mean, I had a lot of awareness and consciousness. Like I, I, I knew about myself obviously because of all the work that I'd done, but it, there's something different. It's like when the rubber meets the road, when, you know, the practice is great, but when you're in the game, it's just a little bit different. So, but I feel like I've, I've worked through something and it's uh, deeply gratifying because I, I, I think for a long time I had a belief that it was never, 
you know, going to happen for me, that I was a lone wolf. I was going to be a bachelor forever. And I was very identified with that. And, and I had a great time being alone. There was a lot of freedom in that, but I knew also that I had reached the limit of my growth, uh, being alone that I, that I knew that relationship was the next frontier for my own personal growth. So it was almost like, whether you like it or not, if you want to keep growing, if you want to keep learning, if you want to keep evolving, you're going to have to get in a relationship and confront all of your fears. And, and I've done that and uh, it feels really good. Sounds amazing. It is, it is really great to hear that because I think for a lot of people, um, it, I mean, the whole purpose of life is unlearning a lot of the things that were driving us throughout most of our life. And so whether you get to it later on in life or you never get to it, it's like the, the constant practice of trying to do so is, is I think, the, is what we're trying to move towards. So, David, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Everything will be, of course, in the, in the show notes. Uh, you can find me at davidsutcliffe.com. It's all there, davidsutcliffe.com. And uh, I'm on Instagram, David Sutcliffe 33. And yeah, yeah, you'll find me. You can, you yeah. can find me, David Sutcliffe. But thanks, James. I appreciate you, man. That's great questions. Great interview. Um, good to talk to you. Thank you.